Uh, I hope this morning will be an adventure for all of you. Uh, that you're going to cover, we're going to cover a lot of scripture. Uh, I love Paul and his teaching, but he is all over the board. When you, when you take a small second, we're going to go 11 verses today out of 2 Corinthians 5. But he goes a lot of different directions. I will try to, I'm not going to try and answer all the questions that come out of this passage. I'm not going to try and address everything. Uh, I hope, as I always do, I hope it just, something in here gets in you. God speaks some way or interest happens and you just start going and run in and study to say, God, what's, what's really going on there? What, tell me more. Tell me more about you, God. That's what I'm hoping. I hope that every time I teach, but I think this one is, is uh, kind of full of this. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, but last week, if you were here or you listened to it, we talked about the outer man and the inner man. So be aware that this is kind of continuing, continuing from there, that outer man, inner man thinking. So 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave, us, gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And then he goes on. All right, join me in prayer. Father God, uh, thank you for Paul's writings here about you and about, really about our future and our current. Lord God, I pray that you'd, you'd take us this morning from where we are, what's going on in our lives, and speak to us and direct us and call us and, and draw us to you. Lord God, do a work. Uh, open our eyes, but, but Lord, also open our interest in you, to love you and long for you even more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we talked a little bit last week about outer man. And when you look at this passage, and, and I'll reread this first part of it, it's pretty clear he's talking about our outer man and then the, our body, and we're going to get a new body. That's kind of the thinking. And then let's, let's just read it again, verses 1 through 4. For, I know, for we know that if this earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house... We groan, longing to be clothed with the dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Okay, so he, he's talking about, at, at first reading, very clear, he's talking about our body's going to be destroyed, our, it's going to go away, our earthly tent, our temporary tent, and it's going to be replaced with a building, that God builds, it's eternal. And we think about that because we know Jesus died on this earth and he's risen. So we think of our resurrection. I was talking to my grandkids just a couple weeks ago, or a couple days ago, about bodily resurrection. Hey, Jesus rose from the dead. That's what Easter's about. Will you be raised again? That was my conversation with them. And we, it was a good, good conversation to have. So we think about that. But what will we be raised as? Uh, there's a, I, I'm going to just share a little bit of, of the way I view this. Uh, because a lot of people say, well, we're going to die and we're going to be raised in, in our, it's our same body. But we, there's all that question about what age. And the reason, there's a good reason for that resurrection of our current physical body, because Jesus was raised that way, right? It was his physical body. They recognized, well, first of all, they didn't recognize him, then they did recognize him. Okay? 
But I take a little bit different bent on this. And, I, and I, part of it comes from this passage of where I currently have a tent and then I will have a building. So there's some kind of difference there. And by the way, this is one of those open hand things. My biggest, everybody has passages that they kind of grab onto. And you got to try and grab them all. But one that really moves me, and part of it's because I'm a plant person, is 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38, says this. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but of bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body, just as he wished, and to each one is seed, a, a body of its own. Okay? So that's where I get that. I get that thought that we're changed. And that's what that First Corinthians says. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, our outer man is changed at the resurrection. Into what? I'm not going there. I don't know. It could be, yeah, I don't even want to go there. Okay? Now, does that create a lot of interest in you? You're going to go out and study that some more and you're going to create conversation? Yeah, I hope so. Jesus said, Jesus said, remember when, when you were in, looking at the temple? They said this in John chapter 2, uh, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it. That's what he said when he was talking about But they thought he was talking about destroying the physical temple. What was he talking about? He was talking about the temple of his body. Remember that? In John 14, it says this, because Jesus talks about him going and preparing a place. He says it like this, Do not be troubled in heart. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would, would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself. For where I am going, uh, there you will also be. And you know the way where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, you see the different pictures that come into our mind? Because I started out by talking about my body and a new body. And now we're talking about Jesus saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Right? In my house are many mansions, did some of the translations say. And it's like he's going to prepare an apartment in a big complex. You see, there's different images coming on here. Paul uses them all in this one little passage. He talks about our body, but he also calls it a tent. And, and, I don't, and he talks about being clothed. Well, I don't clothe myself with a tent. It's very strange what Paul is doing here. I can't explain why he does all this. But what it does is it brings a lot of Scripture together into one little itty-bitty passage. And it, and it brings them up and you're like, what do I do with that? How do I, how do I handle that? Is he really talking about our body at all? Here's Ephesians chapter 2. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together and growing into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into the dwelling of God and the Spirit. We, as the church, are a building. And he's building it. Is, is he talking about the church? He's talking about me individually, you individually? This is, this is fun. And, and the, the thought of meditating on his word is a key thing. Because you can't just read this and get it. You can't read it and get it all by just one pass of reading. It takes meditation, prayer, to figure out, Lord, how do I handle this? He, he says in this passage in, in 2 Corinthians that we groan. In this tent, we groan. Kind of looking forward to that head in, ahead. Romans 8 talks of that as well. It says that the whole creation groans, first of all, looking forward to that, that time. But he goes on, he says, we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. 
So we look forward to what God's going to do, this new building, and we, in fact, the, his intention here is, he is saying, he is groaning, looking forward to that. Oh, I long for that. He's not necessarily groaning at what is going on here, but he's really longing for the redemption of the body. He recognizes, too, that this adoption that we talk about, we've been adopted into the body of Christ, is not complete yet. It's still got something in the future. Now, I said, too, that the, this passage talks, not, it talks about the tent and building, but it also talks about being clothed. And so he uses different wording here. I'm going to take you on a little journey, and this is some passages, both Old and New Testament, about being clothed. And, and, and what, one of the things about Paul's teaching, remember we said, and, and we've proven this here in our preaching and other passages, we come and we take a snippet out of 2 Corinthians, and we use it. Somehow, these little snippets all fit together. There's several snippets right in this little 11 verses that I've read that get used in other sermon contexts. So how do they look together? And I'm still only looking at 11 verses, not the whole, whole book itself. Okay, so here's, here's just some thoughts from Scripture on this clothed idea. And, and how could Paul be tying these together? Isaiah 61, 10, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. He's using it metaphorically, isn't he? Clothing with salvation and clothing with righteousness. Okay, both garments and a robe. Both words used differently through, through the scripture as well. In Matthew, remember he's talking about the birds of the field? He says this, the, uh, God clothes, if he clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you, you of little faith? What's he talking about? Clothes. Right? You can see there that it sure looks like he's going to take care of your needs. That's really what he's talking about. You can trust me. I got this. But he goes on in Matthew 22, and he tells a story. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he goes on and talks about a wedding feast, and people weren't coming, and he goes out and gathers other people from the streets. But when the king came in to look over their, the dinner guests, he saw a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And, and again, you, you're talking about this tent and clothing. And how does it all fit together? In 1 Peter 5, 5, he says, clothe yourself with the humility. It's an instruction for you, each of us. For we're to somehow clothe ourselves in humility. What's he talking about? Putting on some clothes? Not really, no. He's really talking about us walk humbly, right? Change your attitude to be right. Revelation speaks of this clothing a lot. Again, these are not all the passages, but these are several of them. Revelation 3, 5. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father who is and before his angels. Sounds significant to overcome, but God somehow clothes in garments. Revelation 3.18, but he, here, this is interesting, because in the first, in first part of Revelation 3, God is the one clothing you, but then he says this in 3.18, I advise you to buy from me, and he says some things, and he says, buy from me white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. That sounds much like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. His, you want to be clothed so your nakedness is not shown. And we're talking about this eternal clothing, or building, or tent. Revelation 7, 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and people and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed, in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. He says later on in that same chapter, in verse 13, he says, the one, and then one of the elders was saying to me, who are these ones clothed in white robes? Who are they? And where have they come from? And I said to him, you look, my Lord, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. 
and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is really what is coming out in here. Is there some, if you will, metaphorical, symbolic wording of clothing and building and but I hope you're really getting the fact that Jesus is just woven through all this picture. Every bit of it. Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will see his shame. Revelation 19, 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. The fine linen, get this, is the righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then I'm reminded of Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, where it says, and all of you who are baptized into Christ Jesus have clothed yourself with Christ. So what's he talking about? Our body? The church? Is he talking about clothing or is he talking about building? I, I would say they are completely intertwined. Let's go on in 2 Corinthians and see how that, what he talked about there, might fit into some of the other things he carries out. Verse 5 in 2 Corinthians 5 says this, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. What purpose did God prepare us for? In the context here, it is that we would be clothed with this eternal dwelling in Christ. That's God's purpose. His, his purpose is to gather people and clothe them in this permanent building that's eternal in the heavens with Him. And He plans to do that in Christ. And he do, what He does, He gives His Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus said, it's better for me to go away that I might send the Spirit to you. So He gives His Spirit. And in this verse right here, He's saying, I'm giving it to you as a pledge, as a guarantee. Here, here's a taste of what you're to receive. And many people look at it as though that's the, the guarantee. If you have the Spirit, you're in. And, and I, I get that. I totally agree, believe, agree with that. Because it says in, in Romans 8, 9, however... You are not of the flesh, but of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. This idea is, it's not that I've believed in Christ. It's not that I've confessed Christ or received Christ. It says that God has given His Spirit. That's the proof that you are in Christ. That you have received God's Spirit. He has given that. That's His guarantee of this new earth, this new dwelling place. But it's just a taste. Now, we know that the Spirit is a helper while we're here to remember everything that God is, has, or Christ has spoken. But it's a taste of what's to come. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Isn't that what Jesus said about Himself? And now He's saying it about us. That our, temple is, or our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Again, fit that in with Paul is what he's writing. Let's go on in 6. Chapter 5, verse 6 in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, always being of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Do you guys get that? Right now we are in the body, so we are absent from the Lord. We talk about the Lord is with us and wherever we, when we pray, the Lord is here, but we get it too that, that He's here by spirit, but He's not here face to face. So we're in the flesh right now, and so we walk by faith, not by sight. There's a difference between now and eternity. And this is the big difference, is right now we walk by faith. And, and faith in what we talked about last week, what we're talking about today, is huge. Not, not just faith in faith, but faith in God through Christ Jesus, in this purpose that He's laid out here. 
faith that, that something is going to happen. I don't have to have all the details to know that He's going to take me from where I'm at and transfer me now, that has a benefit now, but also eternally. But he says we've got to have courage. He says it twice in this passage, right? And just in these, what, two verses? Six through eight, three verses. He says it twice about having courage. Why do you have to have courage? Well, part of it is the fact that you've got opposition. There's people trying to say, man, you're stupid. Why would you believe such stuff? Or they're trying to get you to believe something else. They're trying to lead you astray. But probably the biggest part is you can't see it. You can't see Christ. You're doing it based on what somebody wrote, some testimonies of people. And, you've, and I, I would say this of myself, I tasted, and I've tasted the goodness of the Lord. I, I still remember when I first came to Christ, I just applied some of these things, believed it and applied it, and I'm like, wow. I tasted and it's good. But it takes courage to keep going. There's times when you're faced with opposition. But I got to, this is probably one of the key questions in this passage here. He says here, I say and pref I prefer rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. Let me ask you this question Do you prefer to be here in the flesh? or to be there with Christ Jesus. There's a song I uh, heard many years ago. Um, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now. And I think that probably describes most of us in this room. Now, I, I, don't, I don't call that a sin or anything. I'm not, I'm not saying that's even necessarily wrong in such and such. But what Paul is saying of himself, he's saying, I'm here in the flesh and I'm ready to go. I'm wanting to go now. I would much rather be there than here. I'm ready to go now. Now, you, you also, you'll hear it in another place. He says, I much prefer to be to Christ, but by staying here, I'm more fruitful to you. So Paul recognizes it's not his call. Okay, so this idea that I'm going to kill myself so I can go be with the Lord, no, nope, that didn't work. The idea here is that God will determine that timing. But man, I sure prefer to be with the Lord. I, I had, there's something in us, there's something in us that, that God has placed in us to preserve life. Right? We want to be safe. We want to live. And I think that's God-given. It's not just, it's not, wow, you don't like God. No, it's not at all. I had a dream last night that I was being chased by a grizzly bear. Okay, guess what I did? I ran, right? That's what, that's what we would all do. Okay, now the, the idea is that, yes, I, th I think this is a, a maturity. Uh, I don't think it's just because he was old and he was about ready to die. I don't think that's it. But he, I was sitting in, in the, I, when I pray in the morning sometimes, I'll sit in a window, and there'll be just a little bit of light showing. And just a couple weeks ago, remember it snowed on Sunday. And this was a Monday morning, and the, the, there's a little bit of light, but the snow was on the trees. And I was looking down into the trees behind the house, and there was, there was snow on the trees that gave me a depth into the forest. And I, I was amazed, first of all, because I, now I, I get a little bit of what you artistic people see that I typically don't see. Like, man, it's a tree. And you see, no, there's depth. But that's what I was, and I was looking at that, and I was, wow, Lord, this is beautiful. This, in this flesh, at this time, my life is good. I like it, Lord. But I also had the thought, and I said it to him, but heaven is greater. See, it's not just that, oh, my life is miserable, I want to go to heaven. No, my life is great. I want to go with God. That's the maturity that I think Paul was at. He just recognized by looking at, 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 at what God had done and what he was doing in Christ, he was able to look at the here and now and say, wow, what God is talking about is so much better. And that's the way we ought to be. 
And I would say, I, I want to grow that way. This is encouraging to me to grow more out of this, wow, this is good, to say, but being with Christ is better. He goes on in verse 9, and he says, therefore, so with all these things that we just talked about in mind, he says, therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. And I love some of the comments in the prayers and in the songs this morning. We're talking about pleasing Him. But I love that word ambition because this pleasing of God is not passive. It's not just like, well, I'll just go through life and maybe I'll please God. No, there's an active, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some effort into it because I'm stirred up inside. I've got ambition to do this. We make it our ambition. And then he says, whether absent or, or at home. So whether we're in the flesh or we're in the spirit, whether we're in the flesh of this life or the flesh of the next life, in the absent from Jesus Christ or present with Jesus Christ, to be pleasing to him. It's kind of like part of that is you know, being pleasing even though he's not looking type of thing. Yeah, he's okay, I know he's always looking. So, here's your next question. Maybe this is the biggest takeaway that I hope just lingers with you, is what is pleasing to God? What is pleasing to Him? And that's why I want to spend a few minutes, I want to run through several scriptures again. Because the answer to that is in scripture, at least in part. Ephesians 5.10, it says trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So some of the conversation is we should just know it intuitively. And, and yeah, there's a little bit of that. Some of the things are maybe obvious, but there are some things where you can be a student of God. Not, not a student of what pleases Him, but be a student of God and you'll know what pleases Him. Numbers talks about this. It says, if the Lord is pleased with us, listen to this passage. Remember, this is when, in Numbers, when they're talking about going into the promised land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then He will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. So to get from here in this flesh to that eternal building, does it require God to be pleased with us? We don't typically like to ask that question because it makes it sound like we've got to earn something. But that's what they said. To get from the, promise, or from, from the wilderness into the promised land, he said, if the Lord is pleased with us. I would contend that it does apply today. That God does require, it, it requires God to be pleased with us to bring us into his eternal kingdom. Bear with me as I go through this. Isaiah 20, 12, 22 says this, for the, the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Would you, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are his people. And he's pleased. He's pleased to have you as his people. I like that. Okay? Somehow he does something and he brings us in and, and he's pleased. I've, I've inadvertently, if you will, pleased him by just being one of his people. It's true in the Old Testament. True in the new. First Kings says this. Again, we're bouncing around with these, some of these. First Kings says this. It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Anybody know what he asked? You've got to say it loud enough so I can hear it. Wisdom. Yes. Yeah. Here's what he asked. He says, so, so give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people? And, and God was pleased that he asked for that and not for stuff. So how do we please God? Thinking about what, what would be pleasing for him to ask, for us to even ask for. Psalm 19, 14, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. So it's not just what we do, but it's what we're thinking and what we're meditating on. Ver, uh, Psalm 40, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Have you ever thought about this? That it would, it would please the Lord if you're getting a mess and you ask Him for help? Ask any of us old dads. Ask any of us old dads how many of us would love for our kids to ask us for help on something. 
It's an interesting thing. I like this one, Psalm 69, and it will please the Lord better than the, and an ox or young bull with horns or hoof. Remember in the Old Testament they had to give uh, sacrifices? And there's several places where it says God is not pleased with their sacrifices at all for some reason or another, right? But in here in, in Psalm 69, it will please the Lord better than an ox. What would please the Lord better than an ox? If he's commanded that they give the ox, well, the verse right before it says, I will praise the name of God with song and magnify him with thanksgiving. That will please him more. Why do we sing? Why do we encourage giving of thanksgiving? It pleases the Lord. Pleases the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 53. You guys know this one? But the Lord was pleased to crush him. Crush who? Jesus. Jesus. How in the world could it be pleasing to crush Jesus? Remember what was God's purpose? To take us from here into that eternal dwelling. How is he going to do that? Through Christ. Ezekiel, do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked? This is God speaking. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, rather than that they should turn from his ways and live? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. So what pleases the Lord? The death of the wicked? No. Their repentance. That they might live. That, that's a huge thing. I, I remember we, we talk, I brought up Elizabeth Elliot last week. Her husband, Jim Elliot, was killed by what, some, some cannibal tribe, uh, killed a lot of people down in Ecuador. And uh, he chose not to take a weapon because he said, I'm ready to die, but they're not. His heart was so towards them. They're, they're wicked in their sin, but he rather that they, they repent. That would be more pleasing to the Lord. Malachi. Malachi says this, But when you present a blind sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present a lame and sick, is it not evil? Why do you offer it to the... Or would you offer it to your governor? Okay, so he's talking about offering sacrifices to God, but they're offering blind, uh, blind and lame where God had told them to to give the best of the flock, and they're giving the worst. But he asks a question, he puts it in personal terms. Would that please your governor if you did that to them, to him? And what he does is he brings it in, if you're trying to figure out how to please the Lord, figure out how you please one another. How do you please somebody in authority of you? Married couple, how do you please your spouse? Nate and I were talking about this, and, and I thought it was really good. She had some insight on that there are things that she does that she just knows, I mean, she just lives life, and it's pleasing to me. Okay? And we have all learned enough about God that we can just live, God, live life now and we will be generally pleasing to, you, to Him. But she also said that there are times when she will do something really special. Usually it has food involved. <laughs> because she knows it pleases me. And that's the thought is, we will live this life, we should live it, and it will be generally pleasing. But then take that extra effort at times and think, God... I think you'd be pleased with this. And go and do that. I think it's a, it's a beautiful thought. 1 Thessalonians 4, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you received, that as you received from us instruction on how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do, excel still more. You all have already received a lot of instruction on how to please God, and you're doing it. Excel still more. I want to go back to one more passage in Malachi. Malachi 3, 4, it says this, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and in former days. Remember earlier I said that there was, there was, they were doing this, but something else was more pleasing. This is a situation where they're doing some things, offering sacrifices, and it's not pleasing to God. But there's going to come a day when it will be pleasing to God. And, and he's talking to the Jews, so the sacrificial system was still in place. But what was he speaking of? What is this thing that's going to happen in Malachi, in the future of Malachi, that would change things? 
Here's what it says, Malachi 3.1, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. He's prophesying the coming of Jesus. That, that Jesus, again, even in, even in the Jewish sacrificial system, Jesus' coming is going to transform it from displeasing to pleasing. It's going to change everything. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must before, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds of his body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, I don't know what you think about. That, that is not, this, this, this judgment seat wasn't in this conversation, was it? What, what in your life right now, is, is there anything there that if you were to, or when you stand at this judgment seat, when Jesus brings it up, what's currently in your life that just terrifies you? To have, have that exposed. To have to talk about that with Jesus. But that's only half the story. Whether good or bad. We think the bad, typically. What about the good that is currently in your life? And you're standing before the Lord and you're sharing that with Him. What are you participating there? What have you been doing that is pleasing to the Lord that the Lord is going to speak? Because He says recompense. You're going to get back something. He's going to, and it's not necessarily wage. Some of it is. The, the wages of sin is death. We, we know that from, from Romans 6. But there's also, uh, this, this is more kind of like extracurricular because, because it's not like you're going to, you're going to do pleasing things and God's going to say, okay, your wages for that are. No, it's more like, wow, enter into the joy of your master. It's, it's far exceedingly beyond that. That's the whole idea of store for yourselves tre treasure in heaven where moth and rest destroy and thieves do not break in the steel. It, it's, it's more than just a, a direct compensation, but it's God's doing this. Now there's a question is this just a scale of good and bad? Because that's what we commonly thought. If my good outweighs my bad, then I'm in. No, we know better than that. It's all wrapped up in what Jesus has done. And I, I hope you've already gotten that, that that's where it, this is all going. It's all wrapped up in Jesus, what he's done. But it is in us believing that and receiving this gift. The last verse, 2 Corinthians 5.11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. See, it's almost like he threw this, this uh, judgment seat picture in just to remind us that yeah, God is the one doing all this, but He is an awesome God. A God to be revered, but also feared. And that fear of God, that righteous, right recognition of who he is persuades us and, and I love what he says he persuades us or he, he, he knowing that causes us to persuade men Paul himself is motivated by the fear of the Lord and all the things he's just written about where he's in the flesh and he's going to be in an eternal dwelling he's moved to persuade men Do you remember the passage we read a little bit ago that God is not pleased by the death of the wicked? What is it that pleases Him? That they would repent and live. Why would we share the gospel with anybody? Why would we try to persuade men and women to come to the Lord? For that very reason. It pleases the Lord for them, not, not just for us to share, but for them to come, come to a faith in Him, to receive all that He has, to, for that blood of His death to be washing away all the stains of their clothing so that they be presented in white robes before the Lord. Just summarizing, realize 
that we are temporary and yet there is an eternal. We are temporary and eternal. Because when does eternity begin? Yeah, right now. But there is a, a building, a clothing, something that God is, is doing in this eternity. <clears throat> Learn to, maybe. Maybe even just ponder the thought of longing to be absent from the body and be with Christ. And, and even in your, in your good times, think that. Not just in the bad. And, and, and realize it's just because this is so much better. It's so much better to be with Christ than to just have faith in Him, which is necessary now. Now, whether you're in the body or with the Lord, be pleasing to Him. Be pleasing to Him in attitude, in thought, in word, in deed, every aspect of it. And it starts with that proper fear of the Lord. It starts there. And then being clothed with Christ and His righteousness. Being filled with His Spirit. And learning how to walk in the Spirit. Learning what His will is. And doing it. And then persuading men. To believe in God. Through Jesus Christ. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you that you have um, had people who've shared your gospel with us. I'm pretty sure everybody in here, somebody tried to persuade us. And your gospel is persuasive, knowing your, your word. Lord, I pray that, that we would be people who'd kind of get some of this. There's, there's a lot in this, what we've covered this morning, Lord, about um, our physical body, our eternal building. Lord, this whole clothed and naked. and Lord, faith itself, which we live in, and we can't please you without faith. You said that. Lord God, I pray you would just continue to build and move us. Uh, Lord, there is a lot of mystery here. We um, come to you with eager anticipation to know, to know what you're doing <laughs> and to walk with you faithfully. Because we know it's good. To you be, to be, you be glory, Lord, in Christ Jesus forevermore. Amen.